Hi, I'm Josiah Leuenberger, director of the Nashville Institute for Faith and Work. The National Institute for Faith and Work is a ministry that aims to help people think well about their faith and work to really live on mission in the places that God has called each one of us to serve in our daily endeavors. And this is a brand new series here at NIFW. We're calling it My Faith and Work Story. And really, this is an opportunity for us to show how God cares about every area of life and invites us to partner with him when we know Jesus, to partner with God in his mission to renew all things. And so it is our goal to share examples of what it looks like for us to engage the brokenness of our world through our work with the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to inspire creativity for what service to God and others can really look like in our own lives. And so today for our first interview, we're excited to have with us Dr. Brian Lindman. Brian, thank you so much for coming. I want to ask you, would you share with us what you do for work and how God led you to serving in this field? Yeah, Josiah, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, I'm a cardiologist or a heart doctor, um, although I spend the majority of my time doing uh, patient-oriented research uh, in distinction from those who do research that involves more mice and cells. My research is focused uh, on patients. Um, I'm also the medical director of the Heart Valve Center at Vanderbilt. So I spent a lot of time uh, taking care of and evaluating patients with, with heart valve disease. So the, uh, the heart has four valves, and these function as uh, doorways between the chambers of the heart. And those valves can either become blocked, or what we call stenotic, or leaky, which we call regurgitant. Fifteen years ago, heart valve disease, severe heart valve disease, could only be treated with open heart surgery to replace or to repair a valve. Uh, but there's been disruptive innovation over the last uh, 10 to 15 years that now allow us to treat many of these valve diseases with uh, a catheter-based approach. So for example, um, I focus a lot of attention on aortic stenosis. So the aortic valve is between the left ventricle and the aorta. So blood is pumped out of the left ventricle through the aortic valve into the aorta. And in about 5 to 10 percent of older adults, that valve will become blocked or stenotic. And At what point in their life? About 60, 65, we start to see the incidence begin to increase, and it steadily increases uh, with age into the 70s and 80s. Okay. And, and so that, that valve stenosis will progress from mild to severe over the course of, of several years. There are no medications currently to slow that progression. Uh, and when it becomes severe, uh, patients will develop symptoms like shortness of breath, chest pain, passing out. And so at that point, valve replacement's needed. 10 or 15 years ago, that would require an open heart surgery, cut the chest, open heart, cut out the valve, sew in a new one, ICU stay for five to seven days, wow. and then discharge and a long recovery. And now, uh, over the last decade or so, we're able to do this uh, much less invasively with balloons and catheters that are delivered through the femoral artery. Uh, you implant a valve that takes over the function of your valve. There's no cutting out your old valve. You push the old one to the side. And patients uh, have that procedure without general anesthesia. They're able to go home the next day, and uh, recovery is much quicker. So it's really been a transformation in this field, and, and I've kind of lived through this from fellowship to now. You know, I guess in terms of how I got into medicine, probably in high school I began to think, you know, I really like medicine and science, um, but I wanted to find a way to apply it. And, mm -hmm. and this was an opportunity to, to have a direct and tangible, concrete impact uh, mm -hmm. on humans, on people, uh, and to make an impact that's direct in their life. So that's that began to develop momentum in my thinking and, and was reaffirmed as I went through college. Brian, something that's fascinating to me about your story is your approach to pursuing a medical education is less than conventional. Can you share with us some of that journey and why you chose the path that you did? Yeah, sure. So I was initially in the combined MD-PhD program at Vanderbilt, which is a program where you do two years of medical training, three or four years in the lab to get your PhD, and then you finish with two final years of medical school. After two years of med school, I found myself in the lab. I was in a cancer immunology lab, primarily doing work on mice and cell culture, and realized this is not me. 
uh, this is mm -hmm. not the fit um, mm -hmm. and, and this is not what I want to be doing. Um, and at that point, it was, it was too late to get it back into third year clinical medicine yeah. rotations. Um, and, and when I was in college during a summer internship in DC, I had become more exposed to reform theology and, and was very curious to learn more and to develop deeper roots in terms of what that meant. My best friend from college was at a reform theological seminary in Orlando. So I decided I'm just gonna go there. And it was never with the idea of leaving medicine but it was with the idea of, of developing a deeper understanding of a biblical worldview mm. and how that uh, could be applied to medicine and science. And so uh, I did that. It was a very rich experience. The most influential professor was probably uh, John Frame, uh, who taught me systematic theology and the history of epistemology. I had an opportunity to to, to grapple with um, how to apply a biblical worldview to medicine and science and took opportunity to do that in the papers that I had freedom to, uh, you know, in terms of how I would focus those papers and, and wrote an independent study in my final year or final semester um, in which I applied his perspectivalism and mm -hmm. my understanding of a biblical worldview in contrast to scientific naturalism and applied that to the ethical issue of human reproductive cloning and, and just wow. tried to grapple with how these concepts, you know, touch down on, on a, a timely, relevant topic such as that. Yeah. Um, and, and it was a wonderful opportunity to bring those, those things together. And although I'm not writing papers like that now in my time as a physician, as a researcher, having that background was so incredibly helpful in giving me uh, confidence and mm. peace mm. in terms of how I interact with my colleagues, many, many very smart colleagues, many of whom, most of whom embrace a scientific naturalistic worldview, sometimes mm. which they haven't fully thought through. And so it's given me an ability to not feel intimidated or afraid as a Christian, but to even look for opportunities to engage them, to ask questions, not in a confrontational, you know, antagonistic way, but in a way that says, I'm free to go there if you want to go there and even look for ways to invite that through shared life experience. You know, Brian, something that stands out to me is I'm grateful for your own awareness of your strengths and your weaknesses and assessing your interest in what field of medicine was really the correct fit for you because it would have been easy to say, hey, I'm just gonna keep going with what I've pursued. And if you would have done that, you would have missed out on the opportunity to gain a theological education, which I know has been something that God used to form you in your own life and in your work as a physician in a really profound way. So I want to ask you, how have you seen God's direction in the way your medical career has progressed since your time as a student? Having had that experience of research that I alluded to and feeling like, hey, this isn't for me, I didn't really understand that, that research could be more patient-oriented research. So when I, when I started a cardiology fellowship, um, I was pretty convinced I'm going to be a, a full-time clinician, I'm going to take care of patients, what people typically think about when they think about a doctor. But when I started my fellowship, I became fascinated by heart valve disease and began to recognize all of the unanswered questions in that domain. And I started to become curious and say, I, I want to be a part of answering those questions. But I didn't really have the track record that typically people who are going to do an investigator pathway have uh, at that point. So providentially, um, there was a new chief of cardiology coming in at Washington University in St. Louis where I was doing my training. I shared my questions, my passion, but lack of track record. And he, you know, really took a, a chance on me and said, I'm going to invest in you. I'm going to mentor you. I'm going to help you learn how to ask fundable research questions, how to write papers. And so he did that. So out of fellowship, uh, right from the start, my, the majority of my time was focused on, on uh, clinical research. And uh, it's all been focused uh, on aortic stenosis, um, this heart valve disease that I alluded to earlier. And so the vast majority of my time is spent uh, oftentimes writing, uh, writing scientific papers, uh, writing um, uh, grants, proposing new ideas, uh, new ways to potentially uh, detect aortic stenosis at an earlier time point, 
how to perhaps have medical therapies to slow the progression, how to figure out the optimal timing of valve replacement, how to uh, improve uh, rehab after valve procedures, leveraging mobile health strategies. So these are some of the questions that I uh, uh, spend uh, most of my time uh, focused on. So th this, was, this was a real pivot. Uh, so I, I am still a physician, I'm a cardiologist, but but the way I spend my time and the way I devote my energy is much different from, from a typical uh, clinician. And so, so this has been a, a change in my trajectory, but one that I feel wired for, I feel energized by, I feel like I'm able to bring uh, creativity to and innovation and new ideas in a way that's uh, uh, deeply satisfying. It, it, there's an opportunity to impact the patient in that patient-physician encounter, and I still get that, but there's also an opportunity to impact a field and to change yes. the course of a field and to just change the, the way that we manage all patients with a given disease, and, and, and that's a, a special uh, opportunity to participate in, in that type of work as well. I love it. I think there are some folks who might say, if you're serving patients directly, I can see how your faith would play a part in the way that you're approaching your work. But there are others who would say, wow, how does doing research as a follower of Jesus give you an opportunity to really live out the gospel? Yeah. Maybe it feels too removed from that patient service aspect that many would think of as, as being something where it's an opportunity to care for your neighbor. But for you, Brian, I know it's deeply personal and your work is motivated by the gospel. And I would just love, in your own words, for you to be able to share some of what it looks like for you to live on mission yeah. in your field. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I think about this a lot, and I think it is an important issue because um, I think a lot of people, when they think of a Christian physician and how they might bring their faith to their work, they might think, oh, well, maybe that means sharing the gospel with your patient or praying with your patient. While, while those are examples of how those things might intersect and how you might you know, bring your faith into your work, if you will, I think that that's perhaps too narrow. And, and, I, and I look at it a bit differently. I place my work in a broader story, the story of, of redemption and, and restoration. Um, that, that is a story that all believers share. And when you think about uh, the sin of Adam and the fall uh, that resulted, it's one that has broad and cosmic implications. And so the fall is not only uh, touching on, on us spiritually, but it also affects us physically and emotionally and relationally. Yes. And, and so Romans 8 talks about, you know, creation groaning and, and groaning to be released from its, from its uh, tendency towards corruption. And, and so although it might sound a bit strange or funny, uh, in, in a very real sense, the fall touches the heart and the aortic valve. And so, so the, the efforts to identify new therapies, to uh, identify the, the optimal timing of valve replacement, to detect it earlier, these, these are efforts to fight against the effects of the fall insofar as they manifest in the aortic valve yes. that causes a tremendous amount of suffering and early death. And so while my, and so my focus is primarily focusing on the, on the biological or physical effects of the fall, um, in, in contrast to others who might focus on some, some other aspects, it's part of that larger story. Whether I'm writing a paper, a scientific paper, to describe a new discovery, whether I'm um, writing a grant to propose a new way of treating heart valve disease, whether I'm doing an echocardiogram to guide the placement of a new heart valve in a patient, whether I'm interacting with a patient trying to figure out the best therapy for, for them and the best timing of it, or whether I'm praying with a patient, or whether I'm encouraging a colleague who just lost a patient due to a complication that maybe could have been avoided, or whether I'm um, praying for a colleague whose daughter is suffering from depression, or whether I'm encouraging a research coordinator of mine who works with me on clinical trials, all of these are a part of the redemptive, restorative uh, story that we are called to be a part of. 
and, 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 and align with the mission of our Christ Pres Church, namely to, to join Christ or to follow Christ in his mission of loving people, places, and things to life. And so I think with this broadened view, it, it allows all of that work, whether it's overtly spiritual or whether it's these other things I've alluded to, which are very much a part of pushing back against the effects of the fall and being a part of that broader uh, redemptive, restorative story. And so that infuses everything I do, all those aspects of my work um, with purpose, with kingdom purpose. And that's what um, you know, can bring such joy to all those elements of the work and not just narrowly spiritual parts of it. And so that, that's really encouraging to me. It's energizing to me. It's something that ha- has been a, a real important part of my journey. And so I hope that others might think about how aspects of their work, um, whether it's as a physician or many other aspects, um, are a part of that larger redemptive uh, story uh, that we're all called to, be, uh, to play a role in. Amen. Brian, I love it. Thank you so much. What a great example uh, you shared with us in your own journey with Christ and seeking to serve God and others through your work in response to the grace of Jesus you've experienced, participating in that work of, of Christ to make all things new that one day we'll experience when Jesus returns in a complete way. And so thank you for sharing with us your story. We're so grateful for your partnership and ministry with NIFW. If you're looking for more information on ways you can connect as part of the Nashville Institute of Faith community, you can go online to nif.w.org. Thank you so much for this time with us. Pleasure, Josiah. Thanks 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 for the conversation.